And as always, we welcome Bishop Thomas to the show. How are you, sir? Thank you, Ron. Wonderful and great always to be with our listeners and viewers. And here we are. Welcome to Ordinary Time. Yes, there We're we go. We're back to Ordinary Time in the <laughs> Sacred Liturgy, everyone. And before we get to our gospel, uh, what's on your schedule and on your mind? Sure. One of the first things is to, to give a show and tell, Ron, okay. at least for those who are watching by video, and that's to show uh, hot off the press our second edition of the magazine intended for seniors, Graceful Living. And folks, uh, I just need to tell you, I am so edified by the comments that we've received from people who really thoroughly enjoyed receiving and reading the first edition and also the parishes. So this will be in mailboxes of seniors. You know, we targeted that group between 55 and 85 years old. It'll be in mailboxes of active parishioners in that age range. And then also it'll be available, be made available to parishes to distribute to other folks who are interested. And I can tell you, I know people told me they found it on the table in their doctor's office uh -huh. and people were looking yeah. at it and engaging yeah. it. The real gift of this folks is we're reaching out, especially to that population, those folks who perhaps might not have been as connected as before with the diocese. And it's a great gift because it highlights folks from all our 19 counties all throughout the diocese. And I'm just delighted for the second edition and also delighted to hear your comments and your reactions and your support for this uh, magazine and this publication, Graceful Living. And so we all hope to be living gracefully, right, Ron? Yes, absolutely. And the articles, uh, all the writing, uh, the photographs, everything is excellent. And I've heard right. high praise for that. And that's yeah. thanks to our wonderful communication staff and all the hard work that they've put into it and all the folks who agreed to be interviewed and be part of this as uh, being highlighted in the magazine. So yeah. kudos to all of them. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. So that's the that's a heads up sort of a hot off the press so you'll see it okay. and then just a few notes folks on Sunday the 26th of January I'll be glad to make a pastoral visit to St. Joseph's Parish in Maumee to celebrate their 11 a.m. mass and obviously that will be an opportunity to be gathered with the priests and people of Maumee Wednesday the 29th I have a ton of meetings all through the day. Hope you can reach me if you need to. You're always welcome. Thursday the 30th, I'll be ha having the joy of visiting Leal Catholic School and make a Catholic Schools Week visit. So you may know also January 26th to February the 1st, we celebrate with our whole nation Catholic Schools Week. This year's theme is Learn, Serve, lead and succeed. I also will have published a column from Leading the Flock, which you'll see on Catholic schools and Catholic education. And I invite everybody, if you've not been in a Catholic school recently, maybe make a visit to see the good work being done in your local Catholic school. And then Friday, obviously that Friday is the March for Life in Washington, where I'll be joining hundreds of pilgrims from all throughout our diocese going to march in witness to the sacredness of the dignity and sanctity of life. And then on Friday through Sunday, the 31st through February 2nd, there'll be the canonical visit, uh, of Our Lady of Lords in Toledo. And I'm sorry, I mentioned the, the uh, March for Life. That will have already taken place, okay. probably yep. when this airs. Yes. But Friday to Sunday, the 31st to the 2nd, I'll be glad to make a canonical visit, one of those multiple day visits which I've been making to parishes throughout the diocese. So I'll be thrilled to be with the folks of Our Lady of Lords in Toledo. All right, wonderful. All right, Bishop, let's move to a uh, recent gospel from John. Thank you. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me. Sorry, folks, that I'll, was my cell phone. That's okay. <laughs> I will start over. I forgot to turn it off. Oh, my. John Shame the, on me. <laughs> John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I I said, a man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. 
John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. First thoughts. Thank you. So, folks, this gospel from John, of course, comes to us in the second Sunday of Ordinary Time. If you will, it's Baptism of the Lord was the first Sunday. So we've launched into Ordinary Time in the liturgical year. You're seeing green again. And the first note in the gospel, of course, is this John the Baptist seeing Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So I just want to concentrate on that, Ron, for a moment to say that this gospel tells us that, first of all, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he pointed him out, and then indicated, behold, the Lamb of God. Then we're told by John, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove on, and, and rest on him. And so he then finalizes it by saying, I have seen and testified he is the Son of God. Folks, reflecting on that seeing of John the Baptist, the seeing of Jesus in person, seeing the Holy Spirit take the form of a dove, and then to say, I have seen and testified he's the Son of God. We believe in this final prophet of the Old Testament and his word, and we're encouraged to see Jesus, even though we can't do that with our physical eyes of the human Jesus on earth, to see the action of the Holy Spirit in the church and the world, even though we do not see in the form of a dove, and that we can say then as a result of celebrating the sacraments and being faithful to our Catholic religion that we have seen and that we testify Jesus is the Son of God. I think that's obviously the result of our baptism. We testify to Jesus and we testify that perhaps we have not seen him with the eyes of our body, but that we have seen him and encountered him with the eyes of faith. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Bishop. And let's go ahead and get a Sorry for that interruption, in that phone interruption, well, folks. <laughs> it happens to all of us. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> Technology. Uh, let's start out with uh, Monica, St. Paul the Apostle in Norwalk. Uh, Dear Bishop Thomas, my question has two parts. Uh, first, what is the purpose of using incense during Mass? I had someone tell me that it was not necessary anymore. Is this true? And then second, this same person and mentioned that due to asthma, she has difficulty breathing during Masses where incense is being used. Uh, with so many people with breathing difficulties like asthma, COPD, etc., uh, do you have any advice for these people? I am afraid that some people feel that the Catholic Church is being insensitive to these members of its flock. It would be wonderful to have an intelligent answer to this. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Well, I'm left-handed, so often I start with the second question and go to the first. So just in response to the second question, Monica, I hope that our readers and listeners and viewers understand that the church is not insensitive, but makes every effort to care for all the members of her flock, even those who perhaps might suffer an allergy, might have some physical difficulty or some physical limitation. So Monica, we make every effort to do just that. So we are not being insensitive when incense is used in the solemnity of the sacred liturgy. What would I recommend for those people? I'm just going to share with you, Monica, what one of those very persons said to me. They indicated to me, Bishop, I understand that the use of incense raises the, the reverence of the liturgy. It causes us to consider our prayer rising up to heaven. And so when I come to a mass where I know there probably will be incense, I make sure that I'm sitting in a place in the church where it may not overtly affect me. Or... I find out from the parish priest when incense is being used, and I attend a mass that does not use it. I think, Monica, that's just a practical response to someone's obviously physical limitation. Let's go back to your first question. What's the purpose of incense? And I had someone tell me it's not necessary anymore. Well, let me just respond to that second part first, being left-handed. Monica, there's lots of things that we would say, oh, well, that's not necessary. For example, in any look at any sport, in golf or baseball, we might say, oh, well, that, well, that action, you know, that's really not necessary to do. But it's part of the ritual, if you will, of that sport. So, for example, in the liturgy, 
is it necessary for a priest to wash his hands? Because it comes from the fact that he would be receiving gifts, sometimes live animals and food, that he would have to then wash his hands before he went to the altar. So is it not necessary because historically it happened, but it doesn't happen anymore? It's become part of the ritual of the mass and it has a deeper meaning. So I think we have to be careful about saying, well, it's not necessary anymore. And to offer a, a word, obviously, use of incensation has been used in the sacred liturgy from very early times. It's a sign of reverence and prayer signified in sacred scripture. For example, Psalm 141, let my prayer come before you like incense, like my uplifted hands, like an evening offering. So the incense we also hear about in Revelation, another angel came and stood at the ulcer, altar holding a gold censer and offering incense before God. So I hope you see it also has a scriptural foundation, and we know that it may be used optionally in any Mass. Probably we see it more on solemnities and feasts, like Christmas time. I must tell you that I try to use incense whenever I'm in parish settings, mostly to raise the significance of our prayer rising to the Lord, and also because people rarely see it. So I think for those reasons, I hope that's answered your question, and I hope it helps to recognize that there is in no way any any effort, or should be no way, any effort to say, well, that's not necessary in the Mass anymore. And at the same time, there is in no way an insensitivity to folks who might have some disability or some agitation as a result of incense. All right, good. All right, well, thank you for the question, and thank you, Bishop, for the answer. Folks, we've got to take just a quick break. Okay. Uh, we got a lot of questions. Hang in there, everyone. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you to Rieger's Church Supplies and Religious Gifts, the official sponsor of the Bishop's Corner videos. Rieger's is located at 4100 Secor Road in Toledo. Call 419-474-4740 or visit on the web at Rieger's.com. And we are back here at the Bishop's Corner. Hi again, uh, everyone. Welcome back. Yeah, with Bishop Daniel Thomas. Uh, folks, we're always anxious to get your questions. Uh, numerous ways you can do those. You can email us by going to AnnunciationRadio.com and clicking on the Bishop's Corner or Google link the Bishop's Corner. Either way you do that, you'll get a little template. It'll pop up. But you can also go to Facebook and you can go to uh, the Bishop's Facebook page, for example, and there's a way you can send us questions there. So you can kind of get them to us however you want. We we do ask that uh, you do give us maybe your first name, the parish you're from, the station you're listening to, too, something like that. So the bishop has some idea who he's kind of speaking with. And uh, we do our best to get them all on. And we're going to start right now, Bishop. Jump right in. To <laughs> jump in. <laughs> Stay to with us, everybody. Kathy and All Saints in Rossford. Thank bishop, you, Kathy from Rossford. Dear Bishop Thomas, uh, hello, and thank you for allowing common folk to ask you questions. How about that? Well, and can I just comment on that real quick? Ron, I just think. <laughs> It's great also because yeah. sometimes we hear people say, well, that was an awfully complicated question, or that seems to be a, a silly question. Yeah. But we like to take all questions, and precisely for that reason, yeah, sure. that if these are questions out there with our folks, that's what we want to answer. Yeah, so absolutely. I appreciate that comment, Kathy. Uh, she has two questions for you. One, uh, when did opening and raising hands during the Our Fathers start, and why? Uh, is it mandatory, or is it a choice, and is it, it considering considered posturing? Why don't you answer that first, and I'll ask you the second part. Sure. So uh, there is, in fact, no instruction. We've answered this, Ron, on this show a lot of on the Bishop's Corner at least four times. And yeah. so the reality here, Kathy, is that no position is prescribed in the Roman Missal for an assembly gesture, that is, the people of God attending Mass during the Lord's Prayer. So there is no indication in the Missal that people should hold hands, that they should raise their hands, in the Oran's position and or that they should in some way have some posturing. I'm not sure exactly what you might mean by that, but that's the simple answer to the question. It's been discussed over periods of times by bishops' conferences, but with the new missal, it was very, very clear that there is no indicated posture apart from the priest 
who extends his hands in the Oron's position. Yeah. So no indication for the people in the assembly. It almost seems to be kind of what the tradition in that parish is a little bit. Well, we've that? we've we've spoken before about the question of holding hands, and we've talked about how the fact that if it's been going on in a parish for forty or fifty years, yeah. you would have to ask yourself the question: How do you address that yeah. and address it in a charitable and appropriate way? Yeah, sure, okay. Uh, so, second, Kathy, here's number two. You got two questions. Second, there, Kathy. second part was whose house was the last supper held in? And then before you answer, Ron, that, you're dying to know be, that. Before you before you answer that, uh, she does say yes. Yes. She's new to All Saints, and she thinks Father Record is the absolute best pastor, confessor, and kindest priest she's ever met. Blessed be God. So, <laughs> Kathy, what a gift. And as I say, oftentimes, if I get mail, and it is such a joy to get mail where a priest is being praised or I'm being told that how good they have been in their pastoral ministry for people, and it's what a gift it is as a bishop to receive positive comments about our wonderful priests and to hear such good things. So thank you for that. Thanks to Father Recker, Father Tony Recker, for being a faithful pastor of All Saints. And I'm just delighted, Kathy, that you're able to write that. So thanks be to God and to you. Okay. Now to your question. Yes. So your question is, whose house was the Last Supper held in? I was going to hold this till the end of the show, Ron, yeah. but I think we should tell it Yeah, now. do it. So the answer to that is, Kathy, we don't know. <laughs> so we don't know the name of the person because obviously the owner of the house, Kathy, is never named in sacred scripture. So for example, in St. Matthew's uh, gospel. We hear about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The disciples approach Jesus and he says, uh, they say, where do you want us to prepare the Passover? And he responds, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time draws near. It's in your house that I'll celebrate the Passover with my disciples. The man is not named. And then Kathy in Mark, in, the, in chapter 14, Mark, we hear he sent to the disciples, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a water jar. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say that the master which wishes to take the Passover with his disciples in your house. So that's mm -hmm. what scripture tells us. Kathy, we know more than that. There's lots of speculation, <laughs> but the reality is it's a man and a man with a water jar. That's what we know. All right. Good. But we do know that the Lord desires to come into our house and for us to receive him in the Eucharist, obviously every Sunday, if not more often. All right. Good. Thanks, Kathy, for that question. We're going to go to Maria in Sandusky, says Dear Bishop Thomas. Uh, what is being done to change the misperception by many Catholics that the Eucharist is only a symbol and not the real true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks, Maria. So, Maria, I think what is being done is what has been done since the beginning of the church and what will be done long after we're gone, and that is that faithful people help others to understand the faith that we hold and what we believe. So in our Catholic schools, in our catechetical programs, in our RCIA classes, in the witness that missionary disciples who are Catholics in the workplace, in their school, in their families, that we witness to the truth and to the reality that Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, under the form of bread and wine in the Holy Eucharist. Maria, that's what's being done, and I would invite you, if you're not doing it, I would invite you, Maria, to do it and to join others, and perhaps even in your parishes. I know parishes have had study days as a result of the, and I'm sure you're referring to a study that was done, a survey that only 33% of Catholics believe that the, the host yeah. is actually Jesus in the Eucharist. So, Maria, I would say what's being done is being done by faithful Catholics who want to make sure that others know this is who we are. And this is what we believe. And I think you just said it so well, is that if it really is something that everybody has to hand down, it, it's 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 something that young children aren't going to believe in the early on unless their parents teach them that. And I, it's a good point, Iran. And if I may make sure. make a point there, and Maria, part of it is that we have to recapture reverence for the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So, for example, families teaching their children, you know, when I entered the church, is the tabernacle in the center where I can see it and I can reference it? Do I make a genuflection out of reverence and honor for the Lord? Am I reverent in my reception? 
reception of the Holy Eucharist in the manner in which I receive. So all of these things, you know, I think I probably said it on here before, Ron, but it bears uh, worth repeating. One of my professors used to say, outward signs of inner reverence. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful, Maria. What outward signs do we show of the inner reverence due to our Lord in the Eucharist? And Maria, I have to tell you, another thing that's being done all across our diocese to combat this misperception is an increased devotion to our Lord, especially in holy hours and the Eucharist uh, exposed in the monstrance, in parishes that have adoration, and in regular adoration in different parishes. So thank God there is much being done to emphasize the reality of the Eucharist. Uh, good. Thanks. Thank you. Great question. Uh, we're going to go to Kim on so social media, dear Bishop Thomas. Uh, how can I be reassured that my dear husband who passed away recently is okay? Uh, there have been so many masses and novenas said for him, and our daughter is a nun. Thank well, I can say right away, I mean, it's pretty clear that any parent of a nun or a priest is going right to heaven, isn't it? I mean, isn't that, isn't that pretty much the... Could you show me that in the catechism, Ron? Where, where is that? I think maybe I'm making that up. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Well, I would say, first of all, to Kim, my deep condolences and my prayerful sympathy, Kim, on the loss of your husband who passed away recently. Certainly, we will pray for the repose of his soul and for your comfort and consolation. I hope you understand, Kim. There is, of course, because I, I I am not a seer, nor am I divine. I don't have any divine knowledge. There is no possible way for me or any other person, Kim, to reassure you with an absolute that your husband is in fact in the kingdom of heaven. And we've talked about that at so many funerals. You know, it's so sad that we hear homilists canonize people who have died, but there's no way to ensure that any person is, you know, with the Lord, unless those people who have been proclaimed saints and have been raised to the level of the altar. So Kim, first, my deep condolences and prayerful sympathy. Secondly, you've mentioned, and thank God that there've been masses and novenas offered to him. How proud you and he must be that you have a, a daughter who is a nun. What a gift to the church from your family. But I would simply say the reassurance is simply that if you continue to entrust him into the loving hands of our merciful God and Father, then I think that's where our consolation comes from. Because if your husband was faithful in life, then our consolation comes from our entrusting him to the Lord and entrusting that the Lord will forgive his sins and receive him to himself. Beautiful answer. Thank you. Let's real quickly do, uh, we're almost out of time, Bishop. I'm going to sneak one more in here. Get that number in uh, there, Ron. Julie, Our Lady of Lords in Genoa. Most Thank you, Julie. Uh, dear Bishop Thomas, would you please encourage the diocese and priests to have more Latin and traditional parishes? Uh, Michigan, Michigan has quite a few, but I'd like to stay in the Toledo Diocese. The only one I know of is St. Joseph's in downtown Toledo, but maybe there are more. Thank you in advance. Prayers for our shepherd. Thanks. Julie, thank you for the question. Thank you for your prayers. And obviously, following Pope Benedict's motu proprio, Samorum Pontificum, it obviously indicated that where there were places where people who were a group of persons who would benefit from the traditional Latin Mass or the extraordinary form as we know it, it would be those places that there could be the opportunity for parishes to offer the Mass and encourage groups of people to do that. In fact, Julie, we do have one of those parishes, which is St. Joseph's, which celebrates the traditional form or the extraordinary form. And of course, other folks are welcome to go to that parish or obviously each priest could offer a mass, but the whole point of Samorum Pontificum, Julie, was where there was a stable group of parishioners for whom this, t this mass would be spiritually uplifting and enriching and serve their spiritual needs. So there, the simple reality is, Julie, we have personnel needs of our clergy. We simply do not have the ability to found parishes all around the diocese simply for the traditional mass because we also do not have large, stable 
multiple groups of a community of faithful who are seeking that spiritual care in that form of mass. All right. Good. Thank you so much. And Thank uh, you kindly. Bishop, we're uh, out of time. I think we only had one left. We'll have to get to no, it the next did, time, yeah, Ron. We did good, though. Good and, for you. Uh, if we could just get a prayer and a blessing, please. Thank you. So just as we prayed the gospel from that Sunday, the second Sunday of Ordinary Time, let's pray the collect for the mass of that day. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God who govern all things, both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people and bestow your peace on our times. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Ron, I hope our listeners and viewers know how happy we are to be with them always on the Bishop's Corner and how willing we are and anxious to receive their questions and to share the gospel with yes. them. Yes. Thanks for being with us, folks. We'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's Corner.